Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar on materiality and the task force on climate related financial disclosures, it's commonly abbreviated to TCFD. Um, my name's, uh, before I go through the agenda on the next one, uh, on the next slide, I'm going to note that we're keen to interact with you on this webinar to understand uh, what you'd like to know and, uh, you know, and we're just uh, not just talking to ourselves today. So please do interact if you would like. Um, we've got some questions through the chat function and we've also got uh, pop-up polls that might come about on the right-hand side of the window. So please look out for those and respond. We really appreciate that. Uh, a couple of introductions now. Um, you're talking to myself, Adam Pierce, the Technical Director at Climate Disclosure Standards Board, which is commonly abbreviated to CDSB. Um, I've got a couple of panellists. We've got Christian Hale, who's a Senior Manager of Sustainability Services at KPMG, and Ian Wood, who's a freelance sustainability consultant. And they're both members of CDSB's Technical Working Group, which is one of our governance bodies. So just to give you a bit of an overview of the format of this webinar, um, the first section will give you an introduction to the concept of materiality to those that might be unfamiliar with this uh, and you know its application uh, to TCFD. We'll then sort of discuss some common themes and challenges on the application of materiality, which we've um, highlighted in a fair amount of detail in a in a paper that you might have seen or might not have seen. We've got some links uh, to that that we'll send out to you at the end of the webinar. Um, and we have uh, some discussion uh, with some potential answers uh, to those questions, but again, keen to get some interaction uh, and debate. So a quick introduction to Climate Disclosure Standards Board, CDSB. Um, we're a consortium of business and environmental NGOs. It started in 2007 with a, uh, a mission to provide decision useful environmental information to markets via the mainstream report. Um, this is to enhance the efficient allocation of capital and to improve corporate performance generally. Um, we provide a forum for collaboration on existing standards and practices. Um, we look to consolidate existing good practice and provide resources for preparers and users of climate-related information, uh, as well as for regulators to encourage more global harmonization uh, for environmental reporting and reporting more generally as well. So to give you an overview of um, materiality and why does it matter, we, as I mentioned just before, another shameless plug, we uh, published a position paper on materiality and climate-related financial disclosures. Um, to give you an overview of why materiality matters, well, it, it's in the TCFD recommendations, and they advise companies to determine materiality consistently with how they do for other information, which is quite important for consistency, and uh, to make sure that, you know, the, the functions of business are talking to each other, so the sustainability uh, functions who understand the climate related risks potentially more than the financial and strategy functions of a, of a business. Um, th there's sometimes a lack of clarity over materiality and that can be reflected in the accumulation of clutter and reports and obviously reports are a primary function of how businesses communicate to a wide variety of audiences but you know, to if they list companies to their shareholders, their owners, or if they're a private business, then to other sort of stakeholders, um, not just management. Um, you know, conversely, the effective application of materiality is quite crucial for clear and concise communication in reports and in general business communication to stakeholders in the wider public. Um, we look at in the paper some existing common themes across mainstream reporting models that can help companies disclose climate related information. Uh, so I do um, heavily suggest anyone who wants to read more about it to, to have a look and we'll send a link through to our paper. Um, it's on CDSBNet if you're eager and cannot wait till the end of this. Um, to put in context uh, of the TCFD again and its recommendations, so in June 2017, they um, 
published their final report, uh, which details their recommendations. Um, providing material information, climate-related or otherwise, is an existing legal obligation in many jurisdictions. Uh, and this is highlighted in the report. So I think one of the first things you need to do is work out whether this is something you might need to be looking at already uh, and whether this is something that you need to um, do to comply with existing legislation. A lot of this could be through business or company laws, like in the UK we have the Corporation, uh, the, the Company Act. Uh, you've got the Corporation Act in places like um, Australia, uh, and you've got many other sort of business rules um, that all businesses have to comply, and they all expect material information to be disclosed. They recommend disclosures to be made normally in the mainstream annual financial filings, and usually you need to do a materiality assessment for disclosures, and this is stated in two of the four core elements of the recommendations. So in the strategy side, they look at you know actual and potential impacts of climate-related risks and opportunities on businesses, uh, their strategies, business models, and financial planning, as well as for metrics and targets. Again, this is used to assess and manage relevant climate-related risks and opportunity. Um, governance and the risk and um, risk management elements of disclosures, they're expected for everyone to be able to do that. That's not a materiality issue, that's expected, uh, and that's all clearly stated in, in the, the recommendations. So, as I mentioned before, the materiality determination, it needs to be consistently applied, uh, and the approach that of financial materiality and the approach to climate-related or any other types of materiality needs to be consistent. So there already exists regulations that specifically mention climate risk, uh, and there are many more that have broader environmental disclosures. So we've highlighted a few here. Um, we look at the United States and the Securities Exchange Commission. In Canada, the, the Canadian Securities Administration have a staff notice. Uh, the UK Companies Act expects it to be disclosed, and so does the EU's Non-Financial Reporting Directive. So, go on to the next slide. So, I think there's also existing mainstream reporting infrastructure. Uh, there's already you know, standards and guidance documents used for mainstream reports, and if you might come from a sustainability background, these are financial reporting standards, but they certainly have a lot of information and learning, uh, and they've gone through a quite a rigorous process to be able to be in the form that they are. Um, so they, they, we suggest they're a fairly good place to start, and again, we're not building a brand new body of knowledge, we're building on what's already been put out there. So the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, they have a conceptual framework for, for reporting. Um, the International Financial Reporting Standards, so the IFRS, Practice Statement 2 about making materiality judgments, that's a really good place to look at for further information around this. And the UK's Financial Reporting Council has guidance on strategic report. Again, this is a good place where they discuss materiality quite significantly. So if you're looking to understand materiality in more detail, I think those are all good pieces of information to sort of look at in more detail. If you're not from a finance department or have a finance background, I think it's best to start to talk to your colleagues who do your financial filings because I think that's uh, a very important uh, step in that direction. And again, it's trying to, to join the, the dots between uh, between a company where you have some more information about maybe financial risks and want to know more about climate-related risks, or you know about climate-related risks, and you want to know more about how they might uh, affect the financial performance of the business, because it might provide you with uh, greater understanding of how to sort of, uh, execute your sustainability strategy or whatever else. So we're going to be talking in, a, in our second part of this presentation or webinar. Um, where we sort of discuss a few questions with my panelists. Um, we're also going to take some questions from you all maybe in a little while afterwards. Um, so 
you know, I think we've got some prepared questions now that we'll go through and discuss uh, with my panelists. And um, we've got six of those, so we're probably going to take maybe five minutes for each one, and then we'll go on to maybe some other questions from uh, all the participants. We have 99, nearly 100. <laughs> we'll just wait for one more. So, yeah, the first one's about the audience of materiality judgment, um, because you know we acknowledge that there's no single representative user of corporate reports. It's a fairly diverse bunch, and um, you know, communicating to a wide breadth of um, stakeholders is sometimes um, quite difficult. So, I wanted to find out maybe from Christian, how, how do you go about uh, tackling this? Well, um, thanks, Adam. And um, generally speaking, the the audience um, is the the most important stakeholder in in a two-way communication, because the audience is the recipient of, of what you want to communicate and the user of the information in the end. So the, the recommendation here would be for the companies to really form a clear understanding um, who the users are. And the users are already a um, generally broad um, list of within the, the investors or financial stakeholder communities that you list here with asset owners, sell side analysts, and proxy advisors, and so on. So it's really important um, to, under, to get a clear understanding who these users are and what kind of information um, they exactly need. And whereas the, the, the risk and the, the potential impacts that you report um, under the TCFD pretty much um, remain the same, you, you should tailor the information that you provide. So for example, a mainstream investor or an analyst um, would be more interested in the aggregate level, whereas um, specific lenders um, for specific um, projects or investments might be more interested into more specific information in relation to climate risks and opportunities for that specific um, investment. So the key message is here, kind of know your target audience and specify and tailor the disclosures um, accordingly in various communication channels. Thanks, Christian. Ian, have you got anything to add? Hi. Um, I think, from my perspective, um, having been involved with the non-financial reporting side of things for some years, there's a huge amount of learning that fi the financial reporting community can take from the sustainability reporters. Um, you know, a sustain the the target audience for a sustainability report is an even broader church um, than, than the investment community. And some, you know, people that have been involved with the sustainability reporting for some time have got. Uh, the tools and the um, ideas on just how to narrow or distill down um, all those different requirements into well, these are the big stories that need, to, these are the big disclosures, the big pieces of information that will um, cover the basis for the majority, if you like, of, of this target audience. The second bit to it really is, you know, big companies certainly will be getting asked questions directly uh, from these different categories in, in, of investors. What's the communality in the questions being asked and, and how does that help then um, to produce a, an annual uh, report that uh, you can actually say, hi guys, we've produced this information, it's in our annual report. Um, Here's where you go to look for it. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And that, that's really interesting. It, it sort of echoes what the IESB have actually stated is, that, you know, finding common ground to sort of meet a broad range of those sort of different audiences is the sort of way forward they expect on financial disclosures. And I think this should be no different in, uh, you know, for any 
climate-related disclosures. Um, there's also an interesting point that the Harvest Business School's done a study uh, saying that I think board might want to look at issuing forward-looking statement of significant audiences to sort of inform readers uh, of who the board believes to be important in terms of their audience. And yeah, so they're essentially stating, um, you know, this is their intended audience for this report. Um, other stakeholders may engage with it and read it or find it interesting, but they've actually prepared it with a specific audience in mind and putting that up front. Okay, if we go on to the, the next one, I think it's, uh, it's sort of linked to, again, your audience and sort of finding that commonality, but also um, understanding materiality and sort of carrying out materiality assessment. Um, so obviously the absence of immaterial information is quite crucial to not obscure um, relevant information. So you know, what should companies do when climate change is not considered material is quite important because obviously there's potentially like three ways of looking at it. You could record this in the mainstream report, so it's least been considered. Um, and we talk about in a bit more detail in, in the paper again, um, you know, by whether you should put information to in other reports. Um, both the FRC and the TCFD advise companies to put complementary information that's not required um, to be put elsewhere in the public domain uh, and potentially maybe say that it's out there in, in the mainstream disclosure. Um, because that obviously gives you a lot more space to actually explain your reasoning for that as well. So, uh, yeah, Christian or Ian, have you got, let me go for Christian first again. Um, well, but thanks, thanks, Adam. Um, so, but my personal take on that question on the topic would be that saying that um, the information does not um, present material risks or opportunities at the moment could be seen quite critical by a, by a variety of, of stakeholders and recipients of the information. I'm referring to, to a quote by Mike Carney, the, the FSB governor um, of the Bank of England, saying that um, climate, once climate change becomes a defining issue, um, for financial um, stability, and therefore on, on the micro level financial reporting, it might already be too late. So this, this whole thing is about providing um, forward-looking um, information and making such a statement that there are no material risks um, should be based on a thorough forward-looking um, internal assessment on climate-related risks and opportunities. And by doing so, um, companies might find out that um, these climate-related risks or opportunities in many cases are, are virtually certain, if not um, highly, likely, highly likely, and that the magnitude of their impact um, will be at least medium or high. So it would be a way starting the journey, yeah, making internal assessments and starting disclosing such information, if not yet in the annual report, then at least in a, in a separate document like a sustainability report and explain the management approach there. Thanks, Christian. That's really useful. Um, Ian, have you got anything to add to that? I know. I kind of um, share Christian's view is that um, it's very hard for me to understand how any company can't say with everything that's going on at the moment that, that climate change or the physical and regulatory impacts of climate change doesn't present companies with risks and or opportunities. The question then is, is um, uh, material um, and, and just what those other risks and opportunities, the scale of them is, I guess, um, in the way that financial uh, reports are produced. I mean, the TCFD guidance does kind of offer a, a, a bit of a, 
that pathway that um, Christian was referring to, um, you know, disclose what you can now and get better at it sort of thing, in that, as, as I think one of your earlier slides highlighted, um, it's the strategy and metrics and targets associated with climate-related disclosure that the um, task force are, are asking to be included voluntarily, not the government and risk assessment. So basically the task force contention is um, if you're running your business right, you must be assessing uh, climate-related impact somewhere along the line. Where is that governed? And if you're saying you, know, you can't see it being a, a significant enough risk to disclose at the moment, at what stage do you think it might be? I don't know if that helps, Adam. Yeah, I think it really does. And we've had a really uh, helpful comment from the audience uh, saying, I don't think companies can say today climate change is not material. The challenge now is breaking down the macro issue, or, you know, the high level issue of climate change in actionable risk factors and action points that could be relevant, i.e. material. Yeah, and I think this is, again, it's thinking about, you know, how climate change is affecting businesses rather than how businesses are affecting climate. Uh, and that's one of the big things that came out of the TCFD. So we all know that climate change is happening, and most of us acknowledge that. Um, hopefully most people on this call uh, who are listening in acknowledge that as well. But it's now yeah, working out some of the actionable points that we can take forward uh, and you know how your markets might change, how your strategy might change, how your availability of credit might change, and how your customers might change in the future. And that goes quite neatly, I think, to the, the sort of second point around, you know, or the next slide, about materiality is entity specific. So I think giving some more um, grounds around that, you know, you need to make sure that you understand the material issues in your business and how they be, would be affected. And maybe there's some issues that are not currently material, but maybe immaterial in the future if climate change affects you in a certain manner. Um, so I think I'm just going to go through, we present in the, um, in the report a few, um, it, few points in our paper saying that reporting content that is material to the performance and prospects of the reporting company, um, such as entity specific information. Um, we sort of suggest reporting content that is material be uh, because that's an aggregate or system-wide level, it has a material impact on the climate and therefore affects uh, the context in which management and others assess the company's performance and prospects. Um, we look at representative and specific risks. So obviously some risks, climate risks are likely to be shared by all sectors, um, whereas TCFD and SASB and others have identified risks that are likely to affect particular sectors, facilities and industries, obviously the ones that are sort of mentioned the four core or key uh, sectors that they expect disclosures for. Um, so obviously specific risks should be distinguished uh, for clarity. And obviously that goes on to the next sort of point that I'll make is around inherent and new risks. Obviously there's gonna be an underlying baseline. No business operates in a bubble or a vacuum out in the middle of space. They all you know, occupy the earth, they all use its resources and materials and all uh, have people and input uh, as well. And, you know, there needs to be a baseline and risk that they understand and then they also need to understand how they interact with those and what's uh, sort of standing information as well as what's emerging uh, and, you know, what's coming through in terms of risks. And that's, I think, quite crucial for the, the sort of forward-looking um, looking assessments. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't know whether Christian or Ian, have you got anything you want to add to that? I'm guessing silence. Uh, hi, Adam. No, I, th I think you know my my thoughts on this are, are all around that kind of idea that there are two tiers, if you like, um, that in the guidance. They talk about businesses should be able to talk about the governance and risk management and you know strategy and the metrics. Um, 
subject to a materiality in a, um, assessment. So at least those, the governance. Um, and the risk management, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, yeah, all companies, because they don't live in a bubble, need to be looking at governance and risk management of climate change, you know, and climate related risks and opportunities. Uh, and that's, yeah, echoed in the, the TCFD recommendations. But then, obviously, for some, they need to look at material impacts, uh, risks and opportunities to their business. And they need probably, you know, to disclose more material information around their strategy, around metrics and targets. Yeah. Maybe, and just one, one addition by myself, um, this Christian speaking on that question. I think it, it's also, <clears throat> in the first place, um, the companies should really focus on what is what is material and don't start reporting any generic or clutter information, what, what climate change is, so be on the point how that really affects the business model. And then in, in, in the second step, um, of course, you need to find um, the balance, um, what is needed again by the audience, and be careful when it's about um, sensitive information so that you don't publish too much what could be of interest um, to your competitors. So you could leave that, for example, to one-on-one -on -one meetings um, with investors. And then the second point that is kind of implicit in that question for me is, where should you start? And we all know that um, the quantification of climate risks and opportunities poses a huge challenge, and that practice is only evolving in that kind of quantification, especially when it comes to, to quantification in various scenarios. So my take would be that, that companies should explain um, how they approach that challenge and um, how, they, how they consider climate to be part of the strategy and how it could be affected and clearly communicate whether or not um, they are on a journey to, to embracing that issue and then kind of make, make statements where exactly the business model is part of the solution and where it's part of the problem indeed. And then and I continue and, and providing a little bit forward-looking information or thoughts, um, what, what is the end game in, in my view in that kind of reporting is really portraying the business model in, in future scenarios by, by also referring to political, social, economic, and um, wider ecological um, drivers and indicating um, what's the business value in the end to that. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and a good point to sort of go on to the next uh, slide when we talk about horizons, because obviously time horizons and looking into the future and what constitute short, medium, and long term is obviously quite crucial. Um, Christian, I know you've got some interesting thoughts on this um, in terms of what you you see as the sort of uh, time horizons, appropriate time horizons for for assessment. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Well, I've got, got some thoughts around that. And I mean, if, if we take um, the three and trying to to respond um, what they what they mean in terms of, of numbers. So the short term um, for me is, is the one year, and that should be clearly aligned um, with the financial reporting time horizon, um, where companies um, provide forecasts um, on their targets and, and on their performance. The medium term, what, what I um, observe in the market should be something um, between three to five years, which is also aligned um, with the common strategy cycles by the organizations providing the disclosures. And when it comes to the, to the long term, it gets a little bit more tricky because long term can be can be anything from now on in the future. Um, as a first step, um, when when deciding on the long-term time horizon, would be 
at what kind of climate-related risk on the business model I'm looking on. So is, is, do you talk about physical risks or is it more about um, transitional factors? So what you see from the common climate models is that um, physical impacts are really long, long, long time away. So for example, we only see by 2050 um, different scenarios starting to have fundamentally different effects in terms of um, extreme weather events and so on. Whereas on the transitional side, um, these could be already closer in time, so in the medium term. And um, in this regard, um, really refer that, that, that time scale to what you observe on country-based um, policy ambitions, um, how far um, various jurisdictions are away from meeting um, their NDCs, that is, their, their nationally determined contributions following the Paris Agreement. And then in a, in a, second, um, a second point to the long-term um, time horizons, should be clearly linked also to the invest, investment horizon of your business. So you might have plans um, that have a, a life cycle of 10 years, or you have like power plants in the utility sector who run more than 20 years, so that should be considered as well. Oh, thanks, Christian. Uh, I think that's yeah, very important and yeah, you know, really interesting insight into that. And yeah, I agree that yeah, you need to make sure that your horizons are aligned with potentially your investment decision time horizons. So if you're looking at longer time horizons for investment decisions, you should be doing that. And we've also had a question come in from the audience around: Do you think that besides longer horizons, also more frequent monitoring or assessment of risk factors should become uh, more common and well, I have to agree and say yes, and I think again that should be part of the sort of the business and strategy planning uh, cycles as well. That you're also reassessing risk, unless the risk is even faster moving than that, uh, and then you, you know, risk becomes material uh, quicker than that. Then maybe you need to uh, look at it more frequently. I don't know whether Christian or Ian, you've got a, a point to make on that. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think Christian's covered it very well. I mean, I think there are challenges, um, and I, I don't have the answers, but, you know, uh, certainly from a, an annual reporting perspective in the UK, um, the expectation is you, you're giving a bit of a forward view. Uh, you know, the, there's the viability statement requirement, which, to be fair, the government said you could choose your own horizon, but most companies have aligned with that three to five year um, business cycle. And I think a lot of these uh, risks associated with climate change, whether that's physical risks or regulatory risks, are well outside that um, business cycle. So the challenges are there, certainly. to what Ian just explained. And Adam, what, what, what you said is, is looking at the, into that, that long-term development and the point here also relates to scenarios and this would be like active and proactive scenario management and seeing how, so one time when you have defined your scenarios, um, you might revisit them every year or every two years and see how, how the assumptions need to be changed. And by changing the assumptions, you might generate new scenarios. And scenario management, in my view, is then um, acting and initiating actions to adopt to the changes in your, for, in your driving forces for your scenarios. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that puts us on to the next slide as well around materiality, not just being about quantitative information, it's, you know, the qualitative um, is just as important as you mentioned before. Um, you know, the quantitative thresholds are, are good for certain types, and I think a lot of uh, financial, um, you know, materiality is done on the quantitative threshold, but even in financial materiality, the qualitative is still there for context and still provides a lot of value. Um, 
So I guess how can companies assess the materiality of non-financial items which are difficult to determine other than on a qualitative uh, basis? I know you're talking about scenarios, uh, Christian, um, so yeah, we could maybe to, to discuss that a bit more. Okay. Um, just discuss it um, in relation to the question that you're just showing, sorry. Yeah, so I think, you know, assessing materiality of non-financial items, you know, I guess scenarios is one way of looking at it, and that's maybe the newest part of the TTFD, that a lot of people maybe ne weren't necessarily expecting to be part of it, but I think the TCFD thought that that was a way of exploring uh, on a qualitative and quantitative basis about material issues uh, and disclosing information around material issues uh, in, uh, you know, in the potential future. So um, I guess is disclosure the start of the journey or the end of the journey in that matter? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, well, a general statement, it's better to handle and analyze these kind of risks and opportunities in a qualitative manner um, than um, not looking at them at all because you know that it's very hard to quantify them. And what we see now with, with climate risks and also with a variety of other principal non-financial risks in the legal reporting is that um, organizations um, start working on that by applying general, generally accepted risk management methodologies on that risk and um, making a corporate level assessment which risks and opportunities are generally related to the business model and then go deeper that to say on a country level on, on a on a segment level assessing and aggregating risks um, by requesting information from the various countries or various business operations. So again, the key message is um, start to embrace it somehow, um, even if it's only qualitative, um, rather than doing nothing. Thanks, Christian. No, I think that's a good point uh, to make. Uh, it's always worth having a go and testing the market to see, you know, start that conversation with, with your stakeholders um, than to just essentially sit in your hands because I think there's going to be some interesting papers coming out in the not too distant future um, looking at potential liability risks because once you've identified potential risks, you're at potentially greater risk of, uh, of legal liability if you don't necessarily disclose those uh, as it is to actually uh, have that information to hand and actually start to discuss it in a, and disclose it in some manner. Ian, is there anything you'd like to add to, add to that? Uh, no, I, I think I'm just reinforcing what's being said really in that, you know, there's, there's for me, there's two levels to materiality in terms of what information to put into um, your annual report. And the first bit of that is information. Um, by that I mean, are people interested in this topic? Do I need to disclose something? There is then a second threshold that's around the, the quantitative impact of that particular issue that may mean a, a smaller disclosure, if you like, with, with less um, worked through um, in, in accounting terms um, inputs. So, I, you know, I still think, yes, what am I going to put into my annual report? What am I going to disclose? What am I going to talk about? Um, yeah, these things come in in a, in a quanti qualitative way. The quantitative bit has got that second little layer on that says how does this, the significance of this issue um, to the investor who wants to make a decision based on that information compared to my capex or, or whatever that may be. Oh, thanks, Ian. 
I think we're going to go on to the, the next slide, and this is the last, I think, question, and then we'll sort of open it up to the audience for any further uh, questions and answers, and we'll try and tackle those as they come through. Um, so, yeah, choosing material KPIs, metrics, and targets. So, you know, there's many ways of um, sort of recommended ways of, uh, you know, how to use and um, create performance indicators and targets. Um, how can companies identify indicators uh, that reflect their own materiality judgments rather than the expectations of multiple audiences? Uh, Christian, you're able to tackle that, <laughs> or at least give an up, provide some information. Yeah, try to, to to share my view. I mean, KPIs, metrics, targets is the key thing, so that anybody from the outside world can compare something. Um, compare something um, with, with other companies and then make sound decisions. So key here is, is comparability. It's one key point. And to drive comparability, in my view, the company should um, provide um, metrics that are based on voluntary frameworks, like the, the greenhouse gas protocol for the own emissions, or refer to industry standards, um, such as the, the sector guidance as provided by the TCFD or um, indicators developed um, by the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which allows these comparisons. And also, it, it's way easier for businesses to adopt um, these external frameworks um, rather than making them up. However, it, it could well be that um, company-specific metrics which they make up themselves um, make more sense. And this would make sense to, to, to tell your own story and how you, you, you tailor and amend your strategy according to climate change. And the, the message here is that these um, metrics shouldn't come out of the nowhere, um, but they should be aligned with what um, management uses um, to, to track um, their progress towards strategy. So let's disclose um, externally what is what is used internally, and these could be then um, various risk or impact metrics. Um, let me give you examples, like um, impact metrics. Um, start um, reporting where your business model is part of the solution in terms of avoided emissions through your products in the portfolio, or at least a percentage of products um, of that are or products or services. Um, that help to, to mitigate climate change. Um, on the other hand, um, risk metrics um, where you can um, really disclose um, the financial impact um, in the various scenarios or show um, on the opportunity side um, which market potentials um, your, your business model and your new products have um, to, in a decarbonized world. So that, that would, be, would be my take on that. Uh, thanks, Christian. Ian, did you want to say anything about benchmarks and what do you think of uh, no, you know, their value? I think uh, Christian's pretty much covered the bases there. The, the two things that I would say is, one, whatever the indicators the company choose um, to go public with, they really should be the same indicators that they're using internally to measure their performance, to target improvements, and so on and so forth. And and just to reinforce um, one of the things that Christian said, they really need to be comparable. You need to be able to, as a business, to be able to say, how are we doing against our peer group? What are they reporting? Um, and, and as Christian said, there's, there's a load of different sources from that, um, you know, whether that's SASB or, or your own industry group. Um, that, that produce something. No, thanks. Yeah, I, I think we've um, covered at least providing some answers, uh, potentially more questions, but uh, we've got a few from the audience now. So um, I think the first one's for Christian. Uh, it says, if a bank engages 
focused in corporate rather than project-based lending for unconventional bottle fuels such as tar sands. Uh, when does the disclosure of stranded asset risks become material? How much detail is owing? So have you got, a, I guess, great to get your ideas on that. Thanks, and, and I, uh, that's a very interesting and as well as very specific um, question. So the, my take on that, and I'm not sure whether it's the answer, is that this should really depend or depends on a couple of variables and, and factors um, for the bank how to disclose on that. So the, the, the first point that I would make is really to assess the magnitude and the significance of that impact on the whole portfolio. And that goes on um, what proportion of, of invested capital um, is really in that company and, and in tar sense, so to say, or in that business model. And um, in relation to that, um, the, the bank should also assess where exactly, in terms of stranded assets, where exactly um, the tar sense are explored and um, made because um, various jurisdictions um, might have um, specific or local um, legislation towards that, and they might also use um, different um, prices for carbon in, under various emission trading schemes, for example. So this is a tricky one and um, should be assessed and analyzed um, for the detailed case because it depends on, on a couple of, of variables. Yeah, and I think you could say the same thing about other stranded assets, you know, or potential stranded assets that might not necessarily look like a stranded asset right now. Um, you know, you could look at oil refineries or you could look at gas, uh, you know, in the far future if, you know, you're essentially investing in long-term projects. If, if market changes and demand reduces um, and there's excess supply, then, you know, you could be in a, in a potentially tricky situation. Yeah. I mean, I, for me, I think the key with all of these areas is what do we – it's more about having it on the horizon and the company having been – having done the work, the reporting organization having done the work. There's a secondary question then about disclosure. Um, but certainly um, – in that, in that scenario that's painted, I would have expected the, the bank to have done the work and understand what that might mean in the, in the future, so that if they are asked a specific question rather than um, publicly reporting it, they have the answer. That's great, thanks. Um, yeah, we had another question around, um, and maybe this is one for everyone, uh, <coughs> Expecting to see this financial reporting year cycle in terms of disclosure. Um, Ian, maybe it's, I've, I've asked Christian first all the time, so maybe you can give your opinions first. Okay, tricky one. Um, a tricky one. I, you know, I'd expect to see some um, some early reporters. I think there's already I can't remember how many companies have uh, signed up to uh, complying with the TCFD. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of it, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> but there will be some of the leaders. I think we could probably, around this virtual table, name the kinds of organizations that are likely to buy into this straight away. Um, and there will be a lot of people sat there saying, OK, let's have a look at what people have produced in the first year, and we'll get our uh, docs in a row for next year. Yeah, Christian, I guess you might be more at the cold face uh, or figuratively or actually, depending uh, what companies you might be helping. But are you help, are you seeing some sort of uptake with of helping companies for this reporting year? Or um, Definitely we do in, in three instances. And um, what, what can be expected there is, and I don't think that's not a surprise to anyone, this is not a, a full adaptation of the TCF framework, but more qualitative information and um, approaching the subject. 
what we see is um, very high interest in the subject in general. So we're talking to, to many companies and explaining them what, what are the, the differences to what they've done in the past and what are the, the, the key challenges in, in implementing the TCFD recommendations and also what, what the real benefits about that are, are too. So it's, it's quite a, a dynamic and interesting discussion that we observe in the marketplace on this. So to conclude, um, there, there's many interests and we see some early movers, but I don't expect that anyone at least in the German market, um, will provide um, fully aligned disclosure or fully in accordance disclosure yet this year. Yeah, and I think from here in the UK, I know there's a couple of companies, I think like Aviva publicly stated they're going to look at it, and you know, CDSB has a public commitment, um, which I think is the only public commitment, um, and 16 companies have signed up to that. So I think there's going to be a few fairly early movers that are looking to uh, practically implement this as far as possible at the moment, but I think everyone acknowledges it's a long journey and there's only a few people that are just starting it. A lot more people are thinking about it and probably, yeah, there'll be a core body of people that have really taken it on, and, you know, those first early movers, but there's going to be a, probably a, a larger wave of people who have looked at it and needed more time to consider it and to consider the, so the analysis before you actually even get to the disclosure. Right. Just, just, just one more addition to that. The, the discussion that, that we have is not only explaining what is the difference to, because many say, well, this is another reporting framework, so what's new? And explaining that what's new and what is different, so that it's not any more about the impact of the business model on climate or on the planet, but it's about um, the impact of climate change on the business model, and that, that's what it really is, and that gives it a strategic, much more strategic point of view. And the second one is that the whole thing is not really about reporting, in my view. It's more about improving your strategy and your risk management around that and building, in the end, a more resilient business model. Yeah, um, we've had. Thanks, Christian. Um, we, we've had a, an Ian. Uh, we've, we've had one more question. I think come through around uh, the role of rating agencies, and uh, I guess rating agencies usually ask for full disclosure and sort of punish you for not disclosing certain information. Uh, and you know, I, I guess this is maybe directed at me, being CDSB. Do we sort of work with them to align? So I know that I think S and P were um, a member of the TCFD. Um, so certainly their role uh, has been, you know, integral to the TCFD recommendations. But um, I know there's a, a lot of work going on that they do themselves looking at climate disclosure uh, and disclosures generally. Um, I think it isn't necessarily too clear to me whether, um, you know, what their role will be as potential enforcers of, uh, of climate risk disclosure. And, um, Certainly not at the moment, but it will be interesting to see maybe as the, the first financial reporting year comes out to see what, uh, you know, how they uh, react to uh, increased disclosure uh, and how they potentially penalise others that aren't disclosing enough or uh, as they see it as not disclosing enough. So, yeah, I don't think they'll penalise people for disclosure, but they may penalise people for non-disclosure, I imagine. I think that's it, unless anyone else has got a, a burning question uh, to, <laughs> to get out before we, we call it a day. I think, um, yeah, just to say that we have uh, a TCFD hub uh, in the works at the moment. So if you've got any interesting information that you think should be on the TCFD hub, um, you know, in terms of how companies can implement the, the recommendations, um, then I think it would be really helpful to have another – conversation and get in touch. Um, so I think there is a holding page currently if you Google TCFD Hub, but there will be something live in the not too distant future. Uh, and yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Well, thanks very much for your time and attention. 
I think we managed to get over 100 people, so that's really appreciated. And uh, yeah, we'll send you an email to give you all the links uh, to the to the webinar, to the recording, to the paper, and anything else. Just get in touch. Thanks.